What is up, Steeler fans? Welcome back to another episode of State of the Steelers. Today, we're going to be talking about Kenny Pickett and how much faith do the Pittsburgh Steelers really have in this young man? That's what they've been saying up to this point, but they've also been alluding to a lot of strong competition for that number one position in the quarterback room. But before we get into that, I want to ask you guys to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, ring that notification bell. That way you're notified of all our weekly podcasts and Whenever we do some of these film breakdowns, you don't want to miss it. Let's talk about a few things that happened earlier on in the week. First thing I want to say is congratulations to Bill Hillgrove. Here he was the play-by-play -play voice for the Pittsburgh Steelers for the last three decades. And he just retired. It's been a great 30 years. He's seen a couple Super Bowl titles and been through some pretty high highs and some pretty low lows uh, throughout that time. So congratulations on retirement. You deserve it. Next thing I want to talk about is the NFL PA grades. The Steelers didn't fare too well, especially Art Rooney. Mark Rooney came in at 31, just ahead of, of Hunt, the owner for the Kansas City Chiefs, who have won a couple of Super Bowls lately. I don't know if perhaps maybe giving all these amenities to the players is something that's going to result in, you know, Super Bowl championships. Maybe perhaps giving in a little too much relaxes the players, make them content and not focused on the game. That's just... An observation from me. I'm not saying that's true or false speculation at the most. But the Steelers ranked number 28th overall out of 32 teams in a survey of 1,706 players. Worst grades, like I said, were for the ownership. He got an F, Art Rooney the second. Locker room got an F minus for treatment in families. The franchise was ranked 20th or lower in nine categories, including number 31, like I mentioned before, for Art Rooney. The conditions at UPMC Rooney Sports Complex received low marks. The facilities are lacking, quoted, President J.C. Treader, specifically pointing out that the Pittsburgh Steelers share uh, their situation with the college Pitt Panthers. J.C. Treader said that they're the only team that does that. They don't offer what is normal everywhere else, whether that is daycare or a family room for teams. Now, I understand the, the ranking, right? Because everybody else apparently is doing it. Everyone else has their own facility. And I think that the Pittsburgh Steelers should have their own facility. They're a professional team. I don't know why or what or, or the agreement that was made between Pitt Panthers and the Pittsburgh Steelers to share a facility. But I do think that it is something that maybe the Steelers need to move away from. Now, when it comes to the Steelers, everything just kind of seems to be a little bit old school to a certain extent. You know, in some in some ways, that's good. You know, you, you have structure, loyalty, reliability. You've had three coaches in the last God knows how many years. And in some ways, it may not be so great. And this one could be one of those ways. But I will say this. My day job doesn't offer daycare or family rooms or any of those type of things. Well, the one thing about the Pittsburgh Steelers is it's a blue collar team from a blue collar city. You know, the fan base doesn't expect coddled players. And, and you know, these guys have been kind of coddled their entire life. A lot of these players never had a, a job. You know, they've played sports their entire high school career and college career. And then went into the pros where they're making millions of dollars. And, you know, an average nine to five work job isn't in their in their books. They haven't done it. And so when you're an athlete and if you made it to the NFL, you're probably the star athlete of your high school team. You know, one of the top star athletes of your college team. So you're probably treated differently even there. You know, one way I know is I used to play football myself. I was, you know, not good enough to make it to the pros, but I was pretty good for where I was at. And, you know, I had an opportunity to go to college and play ball there. It just wasn't in the cards for me. But if anybody knows anything about football in Texas, football is king. And I can say from firsthand knowledge that, especially in high school, there is some special treatment that goes on with the football players or athletes in general, whether they're basketball players and so on. So is this a product of, of that? And also maybe a little bit of envy, you know, seeing the rest of the, the league having all these up-to-date modern facilities. You know, I've never been in the UPMC sport, Rooney Sports Complex. So I don't know what's inside there, to be honest with you. But they're lacking with a few things due to the fact that they're sharing a facility with Pitt. Is it possible that they're also lacking in other equipment that could help these players, such as recovery? You know, last season and the season before, the Pittsburgh Steelers have been snake bitten with injuries. I think it seems like it's almost every year. And the question in the debate has come about whether or not the Pittsburgh Steelers are maybe working themselves too hard during training camp. And that pressure on the body ends up running its course towards the end of the season, which would make sense. But is it also possible maybe that perhaps this team, if they had better equipment, facilities that it would result in a healthier team maybe i don't know i've never been back there I, I don't know what kind of facilities they have i'm sure it's probably better than i've ever seen 
regardless, but I don't know. And apparently there is a major difference between the Steelers and the other teams in the NFL for it to be brought up and also to be spoken about in this manner and to be ranked where there are. So is it a problem? Is it going to affect the Steelers? Probably not as far as you know, when it comes to how many wins they're going to put up, how many touchdowns they put up, things like that. I mean, a hundred pounds weighs a hundred pounds, whether you pay a thousand dollars for that weight or a hundred dollars for that weight. When it comes to equipment and weightlifting and, and, and working out stuff, I think it would have to be at a certain line or standard. I'm pretty sure the Steelers have covered that. If not, they wouldn't be winning 10 games in, the, in this last season or nine games the year before. You know, they wouldn't be a team that constantly wins. I mean, for example, Mike Tomlin hasn't had a losing season. But in those report cards or in that in, uh, NFL PA survey, Coach Tomlin got an A. You know, the owner got an F, facilities and such and such. But Tomlin still has it for a guy that maybe perhaps the fan base is starting to lose confidence in. The players haven't. You know, they're all in for him. You know, it's kind of weird up to this point. He hasn't signed an extension yet. You know, that was supposedly coming for a couple of weeks now. I'm intrigued how this is going to end up happening if he ends up getting an extension. It's interesting. So maybe it's Coach Tomlin that really elevates this team to where they need to be. Is let's look at, you know, this NFLPA report card and look at the top five and the top and the bottom five teams that are on there. Surrounded up in number five is Jacksonville Jaguars. They're a pretty good team. They're up and coming. They haven't done much, though, you know. And they made a lot of noise. They're a team that everybody predicts before the season starts could be something. They, they, they had a winning record last year. They beat the Steelers. Uh, number four is the Eagles. They've been to the playoffs the last couple of years. They've been uh, in the Super Bowl and won one. The Packers are next. They've been to the playoffs this year. The Vikings are number two. And although they didn't make the playoffs this year, I think a lot of that had to do with Kirk Cousins not being available for the majority of the season. And that took a toll. I mean, they went from Joshua Dobbs to McMullen to I don't know who. And they could never find anybody uh, that could replace Kirk Cousins there. Had Kirk Cousins played, I, I think that they'd probably make it into the playoffs. And the number one team with the best of everything is the Miami Dolphins, a team that he recently has done pretty well. They made it to the playoffs the last couple of years. You know, for some for extended amount of time, they were anticipated to be the number one seed in the AFC. And on the bottom five, it starts off with number 28, the Pittsburgh Steelers. But like I said, for the last 17, 18 years, they've had nothing but success. I know that it's not been all Super Bowls, but they've won a couple under you know, the last two regimes under Bill Cowher and and Mike Tomlin both getting one each. The Patriots behind them, and they've had a historic run for 20 years or so, but they haven't been the same since the loss of Brady. The Chargers, they're a team that everybody also looks at and thinks that they could potentially be something and just kind of let everybody down every year. The Chiefs are the other team that's on this list that made the playoffs outside of the Steelers that are on the bottom five. And in last place is the Washington Commanders, who have been the staple point of dysfunction for the last, I don't know how long, while. Dan Snyder was the owner there. So maybe there is something to this facility stuff. Although, like we mentioned, the Chiefs are there and they've won the Super Bowl most recently. I've been to a few, won back-to-back Super Bowls. So is are, are those two teams the outliers or is the, you know is this an example of, of what to expect when you're on the bottom part when it comes to this report card? I don't know. It's uh, interesting to think about. It's interesting to talk about. Will the Steelers change anything? Maybe. You know, I think that them being partnered up with Pitt's going to be an issue. So with that said, let's get into the quarterback talk. I have full faith in Kenny, Omar Khan said. He's shown us some good things, and obviously there were some issues with the offense, and I'm excited about the impact that Arthur Smith is going to have on him. Arthur is very optimistic about Kenny, and I know they've communicated. We have some strong competition there, and we'll see where it goes. Feel really good about him. Now, a lot of people have taken that statement by Omar Khan as 100% faith in Kenny. He's going to be the QB one. No ends, it's about it. The guys that they're bringing in, they've already said they don't want anybody to come in here if they think to be a starter. Now, I really don't believe that. You know, if, if somebody's going to go in there and to compete, they better have the mindset that they want to be the starter. I mean, regardless of what position that you're in, whether you're the center, the backup punter, the, the third left tackle, you should have the mindset that you are going to be the starter, that all the guys in front of you are just hurdles for you to get to where you're supposed to go. You know, I want players that want to be the starter, that participate and practice as if they were like Mason Rudolph. And I think that was one of the key things that was super important about why the Pittsburgh Steelers want to bring him back, which they do. Mike Tomlin, Art Rooney II, and now Omar Khan talks about it and emphatically say that Mason knows we want him back. They want him back. One of the things, like I said, that Tomlin raved about Mason was his readiness and how he was prepared. He was off for an extended period of time, hadn't seen action, 
since uh, preseason. Hadn't seen action in a regular stadium in a while. And he went in there as if he was, you know, the starter. I mean, it's it looked like, you know, week one for him at some points where he was a little bit off on his accuracy, but you know, he's knocking off a couple of years of rust and no offseason preparation as the guy. The entire year, he was the third guy. So he was the scout guy. So he wasn't even implementing his own offense during practice. He was showing the defense what the opposition's offense most likely would do. So for him to go in there and be ready like that after a few years, that's impressive. And I think that's probably the most impressive part. That is Mason Rudolph, is that even though throughout all the trial and tribulations, all the booing, you know, in a preseason game, all the commentators and the talking heads saying that he's not good enough. He's a backup quarterback. I think Stephen A. Smith even said at one point, the thought of Mason Rudolph as the starting quarterback makes me want to throw up. These were all things. These were all things said about this young man. And all he did was give the Steelers a winning record. He had more touchdowns than interceptions, more touchdowns than Kenny, that is, as well, in less amount of time. Now, I get it. You know, his first year, he had some happy feet. That was something I was critical about. You know, I was kind of concerned if he couldn't get over that. I didn't think he was going to be an NFL quarterback. But he's shown that he's mastered that and he's gone over it. I mean, how many times have you heard or seen that, you know, a quarterback is working on something, whether it's the throwing motion or, you know, the shoulder or lifting their arm when they throw or, or feet location? And it's something that they never get over. It's usually something that you don't get over. I mean, look at Kenny Pickett. One of the things that he was, one of the things coming out of college that I didn't like about him was that he left clean pockets and he had happy feet, really happy feet. Even in college, he had happy feet. Mason Rudolph didn't have those happy feet in college. It appears that he developed that when he went to the pros. Maybe it was the stage. Maybe it was the pressure from the players around him. Uh, maybe it was the pressure of living in the shadow of Ben Roethlisberger and having to go in Kind of similar to how Ben went. Ben goes in when Maddox gets hurt, elbow injury. Goes in there, he'll, he doesn't win the game. But then he goes on a what, 15 game winning streak into the playoffs, loses to uh, the Patriots who cheated. I mean, the Patriots who I'm sure won that game fair and square. And then the next year goes and wins the Super Bowl. Now, that doesn't happen very often. Now, for the Steelers, it's a great thing for us because we got to witness it. We saw a great quarterback for about 17, 18 years. You know, last year there, he was there but to me. He wasn't, you know, Ben anymore. Father time had caught up to him. But for the longest time, he was one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. That expectation was on Mason Rudolph. Ben Roethlisberger goes down, injury to the arm, second week of the season, in comes in Mason. And to be honest, against Seattle, I thought he looked pretty good. He had that moxie, that confidence. You know, the following week, he goes into San Francisco and almost pulls out a W there against a team that would represent the NFC that year in the Super Bowl. Then he gets knocked out by... Earl Thomas and the Ravens and, you know, things kind of go downward from there. Does come back at the end of the season against the Jets and in limited action, I thought he looked really, really good. Looked a lot better than what Duck had been showing the last couple of games up to that point. Unfortunately, you know, he goes down with a collarbone and then that was it for him. You know, the next time we see him is a couple of years later, I think Ben Roethlisberger goes down with a COVID test and he has to come in one day, you know, the day before the game being told that he's going to be the starter and he goes in there, and I thought he did enough to win the game. Pat Fryermuth, Deontay Johnson end up fumbling the ball a couple of times at the end of the game and in overtime, which reflected in the tie. He comes back against the Browns, a, a team that is trying and desperately trying to get into the playoffs. And Mason Rudolph, he, he almost pulls the upset. You know, He drives the team all the way down to get the touchdown. They go for the two-point conversion, and it's dropped. Now, the team that Mason Rudolph had around him was not the team that would go into the playoffs the following week and lose to the same Cleveland Browns. Much of the offensive line was missing. Defensive players were out as well. This was a game that the Steelers didn't need to win or lose. It didn't matter. And so a lot of the starters sat. Now, I wonder if, you know, if it was just Ben that sat and Mason went in there with all these starters, would the outcome of that game have been different? Who knows? But that strong competition statement that that Khan made about the quarterback room, that's interesting because this is flat out saying they are not 100% that Kenny Pickett's going to be the starter come week one of the season. Maybe that's something they would prefer at this point, right? You would prefer that your QB1 be that guy. Doesn't mean that's going to happen. Doesn't mean that when you go into practice or you watch film and tape that that's what you're seeing. Just because somebody was drafted in the first round doesn't mean they're going to develop into something or that they have the capability of developing. I mean, the Steelers have been known to develop linebackers going back to the 70s, and they couldn't do anything with Jarvis Jones. You know, at a certain point, the talent has to be there. The tangibles. Yeah, does he have the intangibles? Maybe. 
maybe let, let's talk about those intangibles. One of the thing I hear a lot about Kenny Pickett is that he's a great fourth quarter comeback quarterback. He has all these comebacks this and a third. And, and, and he does. He definitely does. But a lot of those came, in my opinion, in his rookie season. You know, this past year wasn't that, in my opinion. You know, I think that defense has started to figure him out in the fourth quarter. And with that said, let's talk about his last fourth quarter performances this is in the last four games. We'll start off with the Tennessee Titans. The Pittsburgh Steelers won that game 20 to 16. Kenny Pickett in the fourth quarter was five of eight with a touchdown and had 47 yards through the air you know, on his fourth quarter attempts. Now, in that game, Kenny Pickett threw his last touchdown of the season, which there was quite a few more games to go, five more that he played, and this was the last one. And this this touchdown pass to take the lead 16 to 20 was with four minutes to go left in the fourth quarter. In fact, the Tennessee Titans had two opportunities to to score and win the game. In fact, they drove down all the way down to the Steelers end zone and threw a pick. So it was in my opinion, more on the defense coming up clutch there at the end versus, you know, Kenny Pickett coming through in this fourth quarter performance. Now, he did put up a touchdown and he put up more completions than than incompletions. 47 yards don't seem too bad. Let's go to the next game. And this is against the Green Bay Packers with the Pittsburgh Steelers 123 to 19. If you guys remember, this is a game where the entire secondary of the Green Bay Packers was depleted. They had some practice squad guys. This was the game where if you ask me when I started to doubt Kenny Pickett started to think that maybe he's not the guy. It was this game. And I was expecting him to have a breakout game here. You know, it was at home against a team that was three and six at the time, one and four on the road, depleted secondary, and the special teams outscored the Pittsburgh Steelers offense, including a safety block punt. I don't know if you guys remember that. So Kenny Pickett in this game against the Green Bay Packers, he went in the fourth quarter, they scored three points. He was three of six for 36 yards. And the last two drives for the Green Bay Packers ended up with interceptions by the defense. One of them at the last second with only three seconds to go left in the game. They were at the Pittsburgh 16 when that pass was intercepted. And the previous interception was at the Pittsburgh 14 with 320 to go. So you had two interceptions with the Green Bay Packers in the red zone. And in between that, Kenny Pickett had one drive for six plays, 17 yards. Again, these aren't numbers that are screaming out. This guy is really, really good in the fourth quarter. Three of six, 36, no TDs. And your defense bells you out with two red zone interceptions. Let's go to the Browns game. Steelers lost that game 13 to 10. This is a one score game. You know, Kenny Pickett, his intangibles, one score games late in the fourth quarter, comes back, wins those games. Let's see. How do you do? He went seven to 12 for 46 yards, no touchdowns. And the last points in the fourth quarter came on the first drive and it was three points, a field goal. You know, I, I'm not seeing this fourth quarter and tangible stuff. You know what I mean? Let's go to the Bengals. Now, the Bengals game, this is the last game he played the full game. The Steelers won 16 to 10. This was probably his best performance uh, throughout the, his, his career, maybe. And it ended with no touchdowns throughout the entire game. But in the fourth quarter, he went six of eight for 81 yards. That's not bad. Not bad at all. I mean, when you look at the totality of uh, of the of his fourth quarters, he's 21 to 35 in the last four games, 210 yards with one touchdown. That's that is better than what his average is. You know, he doesn't average a touchdown per game. I think he's averaging almost half a touchdown a game or a touchdown every two games. And I think his average as far as passing yards go is like under 180. So this is above that. Now, he did have that one good game against the Bengals is that the is that who he is? Is that the outlier? I don't know. You know, outside of that, he would have gone five of 11, 129 yards, one touchdown. And if he would have continued with averaging around 40 yards per quarter, as he was in the last one, 46, 36, 47, let's just put it at 47, the full benefit of the doubt. That's only 158 yards and one touchdown. And that seems about average as far as what he does per game. For the most part, like I said, the the touchdowns, he's at half a touchdown per game or one touchdown every two games. So that is. But in, in reality, although this is supposed to reflect one full game, you know, just using the four quarters, that was four games where he only threw one touchdown in the fourth quarter. And that one touchdown came in the first game that we talked about of those of that grouping of four. So the last three. He didn't throw a touchdown, and including uh, the half that he played against the Arizona Cardinals, where I think they mustered up only like three points in that first half against the Arizona Cardinals there. Granted, I think that, you know, who knows if the Steelers would have gone. Obviously, the Steelers would have gone for it if Kenny Pickett didn't get hurt there in the red zone. Who knows if he would have gotten it when old Mitch Trubisky didn't get that, and so they only ended up with three points in that first half. So when you look at, you know, Kenny Pickett's yards per quarter or yards per game, and you look at that 81-yard 
quarter there against the Bengals. And then you look at the next week going up against the two and 10 Cardinals at the time. And you muster three points. Again, that, that, that kind of leads me to believe that that one quarter was probably the outlier. It was the, you know, the example of a broken clock being right twice a day type of thing. So to me, I don't see it. I don't see this fourth quarter intangible stuff. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe, um, maybe it's there hidden somewhere deep underneath all this stats that don't show it. Maybe it's there. But when it comes back to Kenny Pickett and having faith in him, you know, Omar Khan brought back up that they want Mason Rudolph back, that they've talked to him, that Mason Rudolph wants to come back. It just has to, you know, they got to get the numbers right. They got to get the money right. To me, it sounds like there's a good opportunity that Mason Rudolph's going to come back because I don't think I've ever heard the Pittsburgh Steelers talk so emphatically about a free agent before in recent memory at all, you know, of a person who's who's leaving and how emphatic that they are, that they want him back, what what he means to the team, et cetera, like they did with Mason. And I think it is going to be, if he does come back, this is going to be a full on competition. And I think that Mason Rudolph, you know, if he can continue to show what he was doing, I think he should win that position. What is it that Kenny Pickett can do in OTAs and in training camp, in preseason that's going to show better than what Mason Rudolph did the last four games uh, of last season three on the road horrible conditions with two of those games one being a playoff game where George Pickens put the ball on the ground early and you know the team just wasn't looking good granted Mason Rudolph threw an interception there in the the red zone as well but if you go look at that play you know when he throws the ball and the ball is traveling through the air about halfway until it gets there is when that defensive back turns around to try to locate the ball. Up until that point, his back was turned to the quarterback. When you have a situation like that, you throw the ball. I want to say nine out of 10 quarterbacks throw that ball. You know, you're playing against good players. These players get paid millions of dollars as well. Sometimes they make a play, and I think that's what it was in that situation. But they did talk about leaving no stone unturned, so to speak, when it comes to the quarterback position. And I do think that there is some validity there to the possibility of the Pittsburgh Steelers going out and getting a Russell Wilson or a Justin Fields if Mason Rudolph don't work out. Now, I think that's only if Mason Rudolph don't work out. I don't foresee the Steelers quarterback room next year being Mason Rudolph, Kenny Pickett, and some other veteran, a Russell Wilson type. I don't see that happening. I think, you know, that three quarterback room is going to be Kenny, Mason, and a rookie. Now, if it's not Mason, I think that you probably could interject Justin Fields or Tannehill or whoever you want. That's going to be the veteran. If they bring in a Russell Wilson, where the rumors are that he's going to take the minimum, or at least the hope is that he's going to take the minimum to get back at Denver and play on the minimum deal. He wants to prove it, that he can get another deal later on, if not with that team, with another team. Well, if you're going to have a prove it year, you have to have to you have to have the opportunity to prove what you're doing. You can't prove what you're doing on the bench. So I don't know if Pittsburgh is going to be the ideal location for him unless he's given some sort of indication that he's going to be QB1 going into it. Now, the Steelers trade capital for Justin Fields, sign him for the, you know his fifth year option, pay him that 20 million plus for that one year next year. You don't do that if you have full confidence in Kenny Pickett. You don't trade for anybody. If the Steelers truly had full confidence in Kenny Pickett, they wouldn't want Mason Rudolph back as bad as they do. Would they like him back? Sure. But would they want him back and and emphasize it as much as they are? Probably not. You know, the Steelers are a team, from what I've heard, that will tell a player, hey, go check it out. This is our offer. If you know you don't get anything, you can come back. You know, you don't take that offer at that moment. They're going to go shopping. And that offer is available to that player until it's not. Until the Steelers have acquired a player in that same position and paid them money. Well, now they no longer need the former Steeler who is now a free agent. All indications is the Steelers have been talking with Mason and his representative, and they're waiting to see if the deal can get done. I think it's going to get done, you I think this is probably plan A, Mason Rudolph. Plan B, maybe Russell Wilson. That's the least problematic situation, you know, unless somebody trades for him. I don't think the Steelers are going to trade for him. They're going to owe him a tremendous amount of money. I don't think any team is going to trade for him. So he'll, he's probably going to get cut. So Steelers won't have to waste anything but just that minimum salary that everybody's hoping he's going to take. So kind of put a bow on this. It doesn't sound like they're that confident. About this time, a couple of years ago, 
right before free agency going into the draft that would eventually draft Kenny Pickett. Before they, they got Mitch Trubisky, the Pittsburgh Steelers were talking about how confident that they were going into a game at that moment with Mason Rudolph as quarterback one. So these are all things that I, I've heard the Steelers say about other players. I mean, honestly, if the Steelers had to go into a game tomorrow, I know they've cut Mitch Trubisky, but if Mr. Trubisky was the only pl- quarterback on the team, do you think Omar Khan, Art Rooney, and Mike Tom are going to come out there and say, hey, we got Mr. Trubisky, we, we're probably not going to win. He's probably going to throw about three interceptions, but hey, we got to go do what we got to do because that's what's on the schedule. Absolutely not. They're going to go in there and say, we have full faith in Mitch Trubisky. We've seen what he's done in practice and we think he can translate onto the field. Yada, yada, yada. To put full faith and confidence into him. Is it true? Is it real? Maybe. And when it comes to Kenny Pickett, I know that a lot of people say you got to give him three years, three years. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think you got to give a quarterback three years if they're playing well to see if they jump, jump off, right? If they end up falling off and, and aren't good, the RG3s of the world, so to speak, right? You know, you have a, you end up winning. I think he won the Heisman in college, comes in, wins rookie of the year, and then never does anything again. Ben Roethlisberger was famously saying, yeah, you know, let me know in three years if he's still around. And when it comes to Kenny Pickett, he didn't show any improvement. Um, in fact, he took a couple of steps back. You know, a lot of people blame Matt Canada and this and that. But, you know, sometimes you just walk into a good game you blindly. And we haven't seen that. A 350 plus yard game with multiple touchdowns. You know, last season, he had six touchdowns in 12 games. And ben Roethlisberger has had games where he has had six touchdowns. I don't know. I, I don't think it's as full faith and confident in Kenny Pickett, as most people are saying, but we'll see. Only time will tell. Please hit that like and subscribe button, ring that notification bell if you haven't already done that. I appreciate everybody here. Peace.